Hello, good afternoon. Welcome to Midday Live. It is coming to you from a news hub here at Adesawa in Kandakra. My name is Grace Hamwa Asari. Coming up this afternoon, Accra Commercial Courts places temporary injunction on processes that would liquidate GN savings and loans. Also, Samba mood in Zimbabwe following death of long-time leader Mugabe, who will be live in Harare shortly. On the international front, UK opposition parties agree not to back Boris Johnson's demand for a general election before the EU summit in mid-October. Details of this story and more shortly. Now to our first story, an Accra High Court has advised lawyers for the Bank of Ghana not to undermine the current injunction sued against the revocation of the license of GN savings and loans. The judge, Justice Kumsing, who gave the caution, said due to a pending application, all action or processes being undertaken must be put on hold till a determination of the injunction. He further directed lawyers of the Bank of Ghana and the other defendants which include the finance minister to file their responses and legal arguments within eight days. Now, Frank Oso for ES Group, Head of Communications of Group Indum, and he joins us on the phone. Good afternoon to you, Frank. Thank you for joining us. So we're working the phone line to speak with Frank, but an Accra High Court has advised lawyers for the Bank of Ghana not to undermine the current injunction suit against the revocation of the license of GN savings and loans. The judge, Justice Kumsing, who gave the caution, said due to a pending application, all action or processes being undertaken must be put on hold till a determination of the injunction. Frank Osufori is joining us as Group Head of Communications of Group Indum. Frank, what does this ruling mean? Good afternoon. Good afternoon to your viewers as well. Um, so, yes, like you rightly stated, um, today at the um, High Court, at the Akka High Court, um, Justice Kunti um, gave an order cautioning the BOG um, not to do anything that undermines the, the bank. So we are hoping that by 19th, when all the respondents file their responses, um, we know we have a, a case and we are praying that the judge will be in our favor and grant us the injunction permanently until the determination of the case. Mm. Mm. So what is going to be your next line of action after this ruling? Well, as you already know, we already have a case in court. So this is just the injunction aspect that we are praying the court for, it, so for them to grant it for us. And the judge has in the interim directed the BOG and its agents not to do anything that will undermine the bank, as I stated to you earlier, until he determines on the 19th. So essentially what's going to happen on the 19th is we directed all parties to do a written submission. So 19, there's not going to be any rough submission as according to Justice Kunsing. So he would definitely rule on the matter whether our case brought to him or injunction will be granted permanently or not. But as it stands now, it's, it's temporary until the 19th of September. So we all have to wait until the final determination of the 19th of September by the judge. All right. Thank you very much for speaking with us. Frank Osufori is Group Head of Communications for Group Indum. Two other stories now. The Criminal Investigations Department of the Police Service has taken on the special prosecutor in what it describes as an attempt to discredit them in an oil misappropriation case. The special prosecutor in his latest letter to the CID accused it of failing supply it with a 2011 docket on a probe into the alleged misappropriation of $15 million in an oil deal. The CID says the dockets on the case have gone missing for the past eight years. On June 14, last year, the Special Prosecutor Martin Amido first wrote to the Criminal Investigations Department requesting the duplicate docket in the case involving the Republic versus Georgia Ousu Kwame Bewa Eduse in a $15 million oil deal. 
The reference was hinged on a 2011 letter by the then Director of Public Prosecutions, Gertrude Ekins, asking the CID at the time, headed by Prosper Aglo, to instruct the investigator of the case, the late Inspector Noah Bonney, to charge the suspect or prove against the sureties that the suspect were yet to be found. The DPP also directed the CID boss Prosper Aglo to instruct the investigator to take statements from one Jemima Owari of the Registrar General's Department on the effect of forgery committed by Yao Ousu on the registration forms with an express instruction for the docket with a comprehensive report to be made available to the Attorney General's Department. The CID on June 20, 2018 wrote back to the Special Prosecutor and expressly stated he has made strenuous efforts to find the duplicate to no avail. In the letter, the CID also states the search was extended to the late investigator Noah Bonney's house, but the duplicate was not found. TV3 investigations at the CID have revealed a defunct unit under the CID, Vetting Criminal Intelligence Analysis Unit, was in charge of the investigations and headed by ACP Dennis Ablade. The unit has been dissolved since 2014. Martin Amido, again in a long request in June 2018 to the CID, further demanded the CID provided him with the duplicate copies responding to the first letter of the CID stating death should not be an impediment in the search for dockets meant for public prosecutions. The CID was swift in responding to Martin Amidu stating it will not relent in its quest to locate the said docket assuring the special prosecutor of its professional cooperation. Martin Amidu, in his latest request to the CID cited by TV3 Investigations, described the search from the CID as scandalous because of the money involved. The case has to do with the alleged diversion of $15 million reportedly paid to the government of Ghana as part of corporate social responsibility for the development of the West Cape Three Points area in the Western region. But as a condition for then President John Evans Atamills giving an executive consent to permit the EO Group to assign $300 million worth of shares to Talo, the EO Group agreed to pay the money. The CID has meanwhile started a digital case tracking management system to keep all its dockets and documents. So this one is a story that's developing and we're following it to bring you a lot more on it in our subsequent bulletins. To other stories now, from an imprisoned guerrilla fighter to his country's longest serving leader, Robert Mugabe leaves behind a missed legacy. For some, he will be remembered as an icon of liberation, while others will view him as a dictator. Here is a profile of the late leader of Zimbabwe, Robert Gabriel Mugabe. <laughs> I am president of my country. We have our own rules here. I say we are sovereign. They should not interfere with our sovereignty. That is all. Veteran leader Robert Mugabe has presided over Zimbabwe for over three decades. Born in 1924 in the village of Kutama, southwest of the capital Harare, he was educated by Jesui and went on to become a leader before joining the liberation struggle against British rule. Mugabe graduated from Katume St. Francis Javier College in 1945. For the next 15 years, he taught in Rhodesia and Ghana and pursued further education at Fort Hare University in South Africa. In Ghana, he met and married his first wife, Sally Hayfron. He became a key figure in the fight for independence from white minority rule as leader of the Zimbabwe African National Union and spent 11 years in prison before becoming Zimbabwe's first post-independence prime minister in 1980. He was a key figure in the struggle for independence which involved a bitter bush war against a white minority which had cut the country loose from the colonial power Britain. 
when he was first elected in 1980, he was praised for reaching out to the white minority and his political rivals, as well as for what was considered a pragmatic approach to the economy. However, he soon expelled from his government of national unity, the party whose stronghold was in the south of the country, and launched an anti-opposition campaign in which thousands died. In the mid-1990s, he embarked on a program of land redistribution in which commercial farmers were driven off the land by mobs. The program was accompanied by a steady decline in the economy. As the opposition to his rule increased, he and his ruling ZANU-PF party grew more determined to stay in power. Critics accused him of heading a military regime. In the elections of 2008, ZANU-PF lost its parliamentary majority and opposition leader Morgan Changirai defeated Mr. Mugabe in the presidential vote, but with insufficient votes to avoid a runoff. Mr. Mugabe was sworn in for another term in June 2008 after a widely condemned run of votes from which Mr. Changira withdrew, citing attacks on his supporters. Under international pressure, Mr. Mugabe agreed a power-sharing deal with Mr. Changira, who was made Prime Minister. However, Mr. Mugabe made no secret of his distaste for the arrangement and Mr. Changirai complained of lack of cooperation and a return of violence against his party supporters. After years of wrangling, the two parties in early 2013 agreed on a new constitution which was overwhelmingly approved at a referendum in March. In late 2014, the president fired Vice President Joyce Mujuru and seven ministers, accusing them of being involved in a plot to kill him. Ms. Mujuru denied the allegation. But under Mugabe's rule, Zimbabwe suffered from sanctions, massive inflation and extreme poverty. Land reforms and black empowerment failed to deliver economic benefits. In 2000, he ordered the takeover of white-owned farms, leading to an economic collapse and hyperinflation at 250 million percent by 2008. Unemployment hit 90 percent, while more than 80 percent of the population was living on just two dollars per day. Conditions translated to long bread lines where supply was scarce. Mugabe was will also be noted for his stance against homosexualism. The doctrine, belief that man and man can marry, woman and woman can marry, that destroys nations apart from its being a filthy, filthy disease. In November 2017, Mugabe was ousted in a coup d'etat. These were the last known pictures of Mr. Mugabe. He is believed to have died in Singapore, where he had made frequent visits to receive medical care in recent months as his health deteriorated. For some, he was an icon of liberation, a Pan-Africanist who dedicated his life to the emancipation and empowerment of his people. To others, he will be remembered as a dictator. So the country under the spotlight now is Zimbabwe. And as you've rightly said, they are mourning their longest serving president. And it is right that we go to Zimbabwe and find out what is happening currently in the country and how citizens are mourning the demise of their president. Todd Maforimbo is a, a journalist in Zimbabwe and he joins us on Skype, a human rights activist. He joins us on Skype. Todd, thank you very much for joining us. Kindly tell us the mood now in Zimbabwe. Oh, thank you for having me and for, for clarifying that I'm actually a, a human rights activist and I uh, personally was one of the people that was on the receiving end of uh, the Mugabe um, hand of uh, authority, so to speak. Um, it, it's, it's a mixed feeling uh, for Zimbabweans because on the one hand, this is the man that uh, led the liberation from colonialism. And on the other hand, this is the man that presided over the demise of the economy and the livelihoods of people in Zimbabwe. I mean, we have someone that was stubborn all throughout, and this is one man that stuck by whatever word he said, because he always believed he was right. Um, you rightfully narrated all the things that um, Mugabe did and implemented in Zimbabwe. But now, um, with the way that um, he was ousted, um, 
He is one person that um, has said to his family, and it has been made public knowledge, that uh, he does not want to be buried at the Heroes Acre, which is um, quite, uh, you know, uh, surprising because um, all the people that um, he has put there, we believe he should be accommodating them in, at the Heroes Acre. And this is a man that has externalized a lot of um, national wealth. We can see even by the lifestyle of his uh, children and the way they all um, squander the, 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 the hard-earned resources of the country. So um, a lot of people think, yes, he did very well to give us land to kick the white people out. But on the other hand, what did we really benefit as a country? So it's, it's, um, it's a confused and uh, mixed emotions. Um, that would be the best description at the moment. Mm. So you, as, as a human rights activist, like you rightly said, Zimbabwe had a lot of issues, or citizens had a lot of issues with him on how authoritative he was. Do you think he could have done more as a leader or as a president? Yes, he, he could have done more. Um, So we'll try and get Swad Maforimbo back on Skype so we speak with him. He is a human rights activist in Zimbabwe and he was updating us on it. Let's do a lot more on the demise of Mugabe. Let me tell you four facts about Mugabe and most of it is connected to Ghana. Now, his first wife was a Ghanaian. So it was in Ghana where he's, he met his first wife, Sally Hefron, for the first time and got married to her. However... He got married to Grace Mafuru, who is his present wife. After Sally's death, he had Hefron, but he died at the age of four. Had a, a son with Hefron, who died at four. And he, has, he now has two sons and one daughter with Grace Mafuru, who is also called Grace Mugabe, his current wife. He was also a teacher in Ghana. Now, he was a student of Achimota College, where he was trained as a teacher. And then he taught at the Apoa Secondary School and the St. Mary's Training College in Takrade. So he had much of his life living here in Ghana. And then he was also a lottery winner. This is very interesting. In 2000, when Zimbabwe was barely managing to come out of the worst famine and one of the two Zimbabweans was suffering from continuous unemployment, Robert Mugabe was named as the one that was miraculously drawn by the National Lottery in Zimbabwe, winning 10,000 Zimbabwean dollars. And so you have to know that. And then the last one, his... He was also raised by a single parent. That is, his mother was left alone to raise him and his three other siblings on her own. So Mugabe tried to help his mother by tending cows and doing odd jobs in his childhood. So four facts there. Four facts there about the late president of Zimbabwe, Robert Gabriel Mugabe. Todd Maforimbo is back on Skype, so let's finish our conversation we were having with him. So, so Todd, I was asking you if he could have done more as a president. He became the center of power, mm. and um, the, the, the henchmen that surrounded him um, sort of like shielded him from the things that were happening in the country. He should have done more to engage the masses. He should have done more to penetrate, you know, even in those areas where he's got massive, where he had massive support in the rural areas to, to do more to even uplift the country. There, there are certain things that he did, uh, like pulling us out of the Commonwealth and, um, you know, um, human rights abuses that have ended us up on under sanctions and things like that. Those were simple things that Mugabe could have, uh, you know, uh, put right but he chose not to simply because he was Robert Mugabe. Mm. All right, Todd, thank you very much for joining us. Todd Maforimbo is a human rights activist and he joined us all the way from Zimbabwe to update us on the current mood in the country even as they mourn the demise of their longest serving president. Now, let's move away from Zimbabwe and come to Ghana where the Asante Youth Association is planning to embark on a sustained demonstration against government in the coming days. The group claims the political world bank of the ruling party is being starved of development. William Sevans Income speaks to the Secretary of the Association from Kumasi.
finance minister went to parliament to present the Impuntu budget. And we understand that some 73.4 billion um, was voted um, for the 2019 fiscal year. Now, let's talk about infrastructure or development as far as that particular budget is concerned. So certain road projects were mentioned in that particular budget as far as the Ashanti region is concerned. So we are talking about the Anyang Nkwanta Obwasi Road, Datano Anokwa Suhinsu Road, Yinehin Ariansu Road, Yinehin Chichire Road, Okonfanoche Ebuakwa Road, Kumasi City Inner City Roads, including those at Swami, Tafo Pankrono, Asokwa, Kwadaso, Oforikrum, Bantama, and Inshayaso, where we are at the moment. Now, if you really want to understand why Aya and other groups in the Ashanti region want to embark on this particular demonstration, their message is very clear that the Ashanti region is being deprived of certain developmental projects. I have with me um, TK, who is the General Secretary of the Ashanti Youth Association. So TK, one will also say that, considering the exigencies from the various sectors of the economy, if you embark on this particular demonstration, you are only putting the government in a very tight, I mean, position. We are not putting pressure on the government and we are not putting pressure on any political administration. Um, things that we are talking about are things which are not new. These are projects that government upon successive government have started. And as you said, as you laid the facts, these are projects that have been budgeted for. And you, you go to the project side, take our roles, take our health sector, hospitals, and nothing is going on. TK, you also agree with me that, I mean, it has started. Is that not enough for you? Because before, I mean, 2019, this particular project, which is told, but we all admit, um, wasn't here. I mean, we are seeing evidence of something happening as far as the Ashanti region is concerned. So if they have started it, they have to complete it. You cannot tell me this is a completed project. Okay, then you shouldn't have even started at all. Because, look, this is first-class residential area where we are standing now. This is Ahonjo Dabai, which can be compared to uh, cantonment or spin test or whatever city or town in Greater Accra. Okay, we know number of projects that were started huh? and it has been completed in other regions. Take this particular project, for instance. This project was started before Pokuyasi of Angkor overhead. What is happening there? Yeah, we're not comparing apples no, and oranges no, but, because these but, are two, but, but I mean, life, they have need, two different in, situations. In life, you need to compare, okay, so that you can move on as human being, you can move on as a society. You want to understand the cascading effect as far as the um, stalling of this particular project is concerned. So as you can see, all the cars that are supposed to connect directly um, to Ahonjo, they have to use a detour which is not even um, good enough. So it has provided the commercial drivers enough reasons why they should take exorbitant fares from the, uh, I mean, prospective passengers as far as this particular place. And you can see there's also kind of a cutoff between the industrial enclave of that and then that of Ahonjo. Business around this area, and they tell me, some of the people that I have engaged tell me that they are also running at a loss. From Daban Ahonjo in the Kumase metropolis, I am William Evans Inkum, TV3 News. And in the studio, my name is Grace Hamwa Asari. On our MTN video report, a concerned citizen reports on a road construction at Kaswa Akwele in the central region. This is a road that they are constructing at uh, Aquili, a suburb of Kaswa. The road is supposed to be 80 feet, but look at where the contractor put the gutter. He has divided the road into two and put the gutter at the middle of the road. Meanwhile, it's taxpayers' money, so it means that 10 years going, we have to spend another money to construct this road. You can also be like this consensus in and send out your video report via WhatsApp on 055-143-344. Media Life is back with more stories after this break. Don't go away.
Welcome back from the break. Now, the Millennium Development Authority says it has not identified any information to suggest that either PDS, Carbank, Danwell and or personnel from MEDA committed or conspired to commit fraud or other malfeasance in relation to the demand guarantees on the suspended PDS deal. The investigation conducted by FTI Consulting on behalf of MEDA indicated, amongst other things, that the payment securities that were presented by Cowbank and PDS to MEDA on February 27, 2019, which were subsequently accepted by the Ministry of Finance and ECG, are compliant with recommended contained in the initial contract. Also, FTI concluded that they have not seen any document that would suggest that as of March 1, 2019, PDS, Cowbank, Danwell and or personnel from MIDA should have questioned the validity of the payment securities. The report further noted that officials from ACUT confirmed to KL that a stamp applied on the acknowledgement and agreement page of the payment securities is that of ACUT. They further confirmed that the signatures are that of Al Nuri and Fadi Dan Booth, who are employees of Al Kuth. However, given that ECG is the beneficiary of the payment security, they sought guidance from the government of Ghana financial advisors on what the best protocol would be to confirm the authenticity of the demand guarantees. So let's do a lot more on this. An energy analyst, Kojun Safapoku, is joining me on Skype so we can talk more about this conversation. Now, Kojun, thank you for joining us now. Hi, uh, good afternoon and good afternoon to your viewers. How are yeah. you? Yes, Kojun, so what does this um, report by MIDA mean? There's speculation out there that PDS has been cleared. Have they been cleared per this report? No, not at all. I don't see how anybody will come out and say that MIDA or PBS has been cleared. This report um, is more damning. It raises more questions than give answers. And it goes to show in some of us, there are things that we've been told privately that we didn't have evidence to come out and say it. But at least as per this uh, conversation with F the FTI report, gives us the evidence that some of the things that we've been told privately is true. Let's go from the top. Yes, that document that everybody keep talking about from our quotes, whether that document from our quotes is real or not real, that document is not a reinsurance document from our quotes. If you read the report that the FTI put out there, our quote was only asked to give a cover note our court did not reinsure the risk. Mm. So the payment security which was not given by our court. So that is something that everybody has to understand. What we were expecting is that our court were the reinsurance. From the report, it clearly shows that our court only took 10% of the fee as a fronting fee. Fronting fee meaning that they just gave a cover note so that, look, if anybody is to check, yes, we'll give you a note to go and show them, but we are not the one taking the risk. Mm. And they made that very clear to them. Joe Australia, in their narration to FTI, made it very clear that our court cannot ask for any premium because they asked that 100% of their liability should be ceded, meaning that none of the liabilities sat with our court. Mm. That is one of the issues. Secondly, you cannot do a payment security and the recourse when there is a problem, the funds that are used is the funds of the assets that you intend to acquire. In this case, what Cowbank did through Downwell is that anytime there was to be a call on the guarantee, the recall, the recourse is the cash flow of PDX. We clearly saw that in the report by the premium that was to be paid by the shareholders. The shareholders used the cash flow of PDS to pay the premium for the guarantee. So I don't think this report in any way comes to clear PDS. It only goes to now strengthen some of us, our narration. 
Yes. And the consortium that makes PDS do not have the money to do this deal. Mm. So the report also makes it clear that Alcud confirmed that those who signed, those whose signatures were on it are employees of Alcud. What dynamics yes. does this bring to, to, the, to the case? No, see, what documents? You see, you remember what the minister sometimes said. He said there's a grand scheme to deceit the government. The document they went to take from our court, that document that we are talking about, the signatures on there are employees, that document is not a payment guarantee. Mm. It's not. It's a cover note. Mm. So our court did not reinsure, our court did not provide any insurance. Mm. Mm. So government so ask, government asked for 30 days and then the 30 days have almost elapsed. We're looking forward to hearing from them. Going forward, how do you think we should manage this and what government is expected to tell us? Well, there's no rush. What's the rush? Look, the problem is there. Before this insurance thing came up, there were other problems that the parties were trying to deal with. So I don't think there's a rush. Government said 30 days. Yes, 30 days has elapsed. What's the rush? It looks like the media is on a frenzy trying to get news to put out there for 24-hour news media. But there's no rush. Already, the situation has a K-leg. Let's leave it as it is. Let's take a deep breath. Let's now revisit all the problems that they raised. And resolve the don't, 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 don't you think that what, what, because they gave us 30 days and we're working with the timelines they give us, we, ha we have the right to hold them to the timelines they give us. We're not rushing them. They told oh, us they yes, needed 30 right days to, to go the through this. They have to be right. accountable. You don't think so? My dear, what I'm saying to you is that, yes, the media needs to have staff to feed their populace. But what I'm saying is that there's no rush. If the government rush in doing this thing, I'll be very surprised because there are two issues. You either rush in doing it now, and in five, six years' time, this whole thing will fall apart again. So there's no point rushing it. There were problems before the insurance thing came up. Let's hold on, resolve all the nitty gritty, resolve the problems, and do this thing properly. There's no mm. rush. Mm. So will you be surprised if government clears PDS in this issue? Clear them, you see, my dear, we keep using the word clear. Clear them for what? What, what are we clearing? Of any the wrongdoing or of the breaches they detected in the agreement? How, how, what do you mean there's no wrongdoing? Our, there, there's nothing from our court. That is a problem. As we sit now, PDS does not have a guarantee with government. There's no mm. guarantee. So how is that no wrongdoing? There's no guarantee. Be, mm. Anybody who challenges that assertion should go and come and show us the guarantee which PDS provided. There's no guarantee. When, what our court brought is not a guarantee. Mm. So let's not mix the issue. The issue is that there is no guarantee as we speak now. PDS has no guarantee with government. So could you admit that, that there was some wrongdoing? Of course there's wrongdoing. Okay. There is a, a system. And look, let me explain something. Most of the time when we talk about PDS, we are not talking about PDS, which is the management put in place at PDS who is managing PDS. What the people we are talking about is the shareholders of PDS. So let not the workers of PDS feel like, oh, we are bashing their company. No, it is not the workers or the management. We are talking about PDS, the shareholders of PDS. The shareholders of PDS do not have the financial bill down to own the company. Mm. How can you bring $1 million when you are supposed to bring $12 million? You yeah. bring $1 million, mm. then go and borrow the rest to be paid back with PDS money. Me right. and you, our money that they are collecting. Thank you for speaking with us. Kojo Nsafapoku is an energy analyst. Now, to other stories now, there have been many instances throughout history where notable discoveries have been made about DNA and inheritance. These have formed the foundations of what we know and continue to advance today. As the police prepares to release DNA results of human remains found in Takrade, Esi Vinewa Otu explores the history and uses of DNA in Ghana. Know where they are. 5000 BC, when humans began the practice of selective breeding to produce more robust crops and livestock. Greek philosophers explored the idea of human inheritance some 1,600 years after 5,000 BC. 
The notable Aristotle suggested that traits acquired throughout an organism's lifetime could be transmitted to their offspring. DNA is a molecular composed of two chains that coil around each other to form a double helix carrying genetic instructions for the development, functioning, growth and reproduction of all known organisms and many viruses. Chief biomedical scientist at the Kolibu Teaching Hospital, Augustine Sego is one of the brains behind DNA testing in Ghana. In Ghana, they initially I did a feasibility study. I went to 28 courts. So I went far to search for information as to where and when do they request for this crucial test. Upon this study, I came out with the fact that there were a lot Mm, columns, columns of cases that are pending in the court for the DNA paternity. Ghana until recently took samples for DNA testing to Europe and South Africa. These usually were to determine one's paternity, but that's not all about DNA. We use DNA for testing viruses. We use DNA for testing diseases that are inherited. We use DNA for so many, many things. And one of them is for paternity because of its unique information that it brings about to each and every individual or every organism on Earth. Augustine Segu has done a number of different DNA tests, so I asked whether a DNA could be done on the skulls found in the septic tank purported to be those of the Takra the missing girls. Yes, DNA can be done even when the, the case is more than seven years. Yes, because in a skull, with the tooth on the mandible, okay, there's a nerve connecting the tooth to the scalp, okay, and these are cells. I think they are the last thing that they destroy. But he says people sometimes have their preconceived results and may want to reject results when it does not favor them. To the, to the family, to the family, yes, they will have their own preconceived results that they are expecting. We call it um, result expectants, see. But the truth is truth. The fact is fact. If the scalp is worked on, Whatever comes out will be that fact. First, technicians extract the DNA by dissolving the evidence. For entertainment this afternoon, we bring you some fun facts and quotes about the late Zimbabwean president, Robert Mugabe. May I just ask you one question, sir? On what basis do you now regard yourself as president of Zimbabwe? On the same basis as Mr. Brown regards himself as Prime Minister of Zimbabwe. Precisely on that basis. You don't want your, sir, you don't want your security man here to beat me up in front of you, I'm sure. Yeah, but don't ask stupid questions. Okay, but yes, he's an iconic character and needs very little introduction. President Mugabe. Well, he's the president of Uganda. That is a lie. Really? I'm president of Zimbabwe. 
take you England and let me keep my Zimbabwe. That's a famous quote from Mugabe. It's your money, keep it. It's our land, we will take it. Balance. His alleged quotes are receiving massive publicity. Thank you for the publicity you have given me. That's what's up. But there are some fake ones out there. Yes, I've come here to address that. Okay, let's set the record straight then. Okay. Did you say the only warning Africans take serious is low battery? Yes. Okay, confirmed. A woman with beauty without brains is her V that suffers. Is that your quote? <laughs> Did that come from you? Yes. Okay, confirmed. Even if sachet water best at circle, it causes flat. Hmm? Did you say that? Oh, no, 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 no. Did that come from you? All that is a lie. Really? President Gavi said no. Okay. Final quote. No matter how men shake their thing after urinating, the last job is always reserved for the boxers. Is that your quote as well? No. Definitely no. Are you denying that? One yes. Point. Well, it's been awesome hanging out with you, Mr. President. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for paying so much attention to President Mugabe. On a serious note, when is Mugabe retiring? I'll still be there until God says come. And God did say come, and so he's gone. Let's do some other entertainment stories now. American pop star and rapper Nicki Minaj says she's retiring for a family. The top female rapper made this announcement on Twitter, asked her fans to keep supporting her till the end. We'll bring you details of this story in our subsequent bulletins. But that's it for this edition of Midday Live on TV3, also live on DSTV Channel 279. My name is Grace Hamwa Sari. Enjoy the rest of your afternoon.